Let's get it. We are recording for the record. Awesome. Are you done fucking with the mic? Not even close. Okay. We'll let you finish that, and then Brendan will get us started with some intros. Yeah. You good? I'm ready. Let's fucking hit it. All right. Welcome to The Word. We have Andrew Nardone with us today. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. What's up, man? We are thrilled to have Andrew from Boston Demolition and Removal uh, Property. Uh, also, Nardone Group That's right. Properties or yeah. just Nardone Group? Just the Nardone Group. The Nardone Group and uh, general entrepreneur and uh, great guy. Thanks. Some might disagree. but Yeah, I mean, most people probably. Like yeah. that lady yeah. in that car once. Yeah, it's like 70-30. She would yeah. call you a great guy. Yeah, she, she might call me a great guy. <laughs> Huh. Excited to have you, man. I know we were just uh, talking a lot offline about some good topics already. So we already um, did a whole podcast. Before I know we that's what I said. On. I said we ruined. I hope it, you so. didn't blow your wads and get all the good stuff out already. I'm always good for second right. round. I know. We knew that about you. <laughs> so uh, if you could kind of just kick us off a little bit about your background, maybe how you got in the biz um, and uh, kind of the businesses you dabble in between um, the demo work and also the Nardone stuff. Um, just catch up the people. Yeah, so I started uh, Nardone Demolition and Removal back in 2012. Um, within the last about four years, I turned that into a DBA, which is Boston Demolition and Removal. Smart move. Um, so, yeah, and that was just for, like, branding and marketing and yeah. social media presence and stuff like that. Um, don't, don't hit the table. <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> so from there, you know, going back to 2012, I was working for a high-end builder, uh, okay. C2MG Builders. Unbelievable craftsmanship, unbelievable leadership. They do big builds, right? They do everything. High yeah. end, you know, VIP client type builds. Um, a lot of big, like, residential Boston yeah, buildings, right? Brownstones. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're, they're, they're the guys. So I was working for them, and uh, I was doing, like, labor uh, work. And at some point, I kind of made the decision I wanted to do this on my own. You know, if I can do labor for you, Smart. I can do it for myself. So I went out and, you know, started my LLC, and, which was Nardone Demolition and Removal. Um, you know, and I would stay working for him part time and myself part time and trying to combine the two and, you know, two days for him, three days for me. A little lifeline. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Smart. So transformed, you know, all the way up to hiring, you know, my first two or three employees after, you know, swinging the sledgehammer and doing the paperwork at night. What, what year was that? I would say hiring my first official employee was probably 2013. Okay. Um, and then I had people that, you know, would offer like day labor in between. Sure. But. But 2013 is when I started to hire my first people, uh, you know, to help me. And then tried to make that transition from being in the field, like, you know, 7 to 3.30, doing the work, going home and doing paperwork, yeah. to, you know, doing estimates on the days that I didn't have to be there, and, you know, just trying to make the full, the full yeah. transition. The uh, hustle. Exactly. I love exactly. it. So, um, you know, so carried on, and, and I'd say about 20... 19 i made the switch to the dba uh for like social media marketing yeah um and we did see a pretty good change in like website um clicks and views and anything with boston exactly, it. It always exactly. so yeah. it was it was it was awesome sell in boston sell in boston sell great, in boston. Real, boston. great real estate yeah. website for a uh, nice local company yeah, yeah. <laughs> see what you did there but you told me not to buy boston estate planning lawyer or whatever though because that's a dumb url <laughs> Boston right. estate Boston planning, but Bo- Boston estate planning uh, lawyers dot com. But he could own the URL and, and redirect have it redirected yeah. to his. He could. Hmm. So then he'd still appear in the top search. Or we could just pay an extra hundred dollars for like a good one. Yeah, might be worth your time. Yeah, Any I'll have money. to look into that. Yeah, yeah. but we I can, need we Boston. can we can run the GoDaddy stuff later. All right. They have a <laughs> local small Boston zip code office available. If oh, you know, be for for rent. Yeah. Oh, I would love that. Yeah. Can I can I find it anywhere online? You can. Okay, good. Yeah, it's not on Looplet, which is where it should be though. <laughs> so, fun little tidbit. I uh when I first time I ever heard GoDaddy, I thought it was a porn website. Yeah. I, it's not? No. Right. Oh, I think right. Every, I think everyone does. I think that's O-Daddy. Oh. <laughs> hold on, don't look at my search history. <laughs> but yeah, so you know, it wasn't What are all these recurring fees? <laughs> uh, it's a website host. No, that, that's a different <laughs> website. Yeah. yeah. Um good se- good segue. Um yeah, great uh, pro- probably a really smart move, by the way, to change uh, in DBA. The, in the real estate industry, they say one of the biggest mistakes 
growing teams and uh, people, you know, with the real estate portfolio can do is name it after themselves. Right. It makes it not sellable. Yeah. Any right? business, though, and, right? And, and there's a certain there's a certain level of employee engagement that comes from working for a company that has, uh, you know, a culture or a name versus you. Correct. Yeah. You absolutely. know, so they can climb the ladder. They feel they feel a little bit of a better sense of ownership and collaboration, and you know, it's what we do. I don't know. That's my opinion. Hence, not my name. Yeah. Here. No, absolutely. I'm with you. The uh, the Nardone Group still has my name in it. It does. Um, but obviously, that is a little bit more for myself for portfolio control. Sure. Yeah. Um, so we do different property, story. Right. We do property management for ourselves through yeah. that business. Yeah. Um, so therefore, you know, there's really no need to have it be anything else. Yeah. Uh, there is no employees in that. There is no employees in that. Um, yeah. Company. So LLC. Yeah. Hold, hold the properties. Exactly. Ideally. Yep. Exactly. Or. Manages the properties manages that are held properties, yeah, yeah. separately and yep. probably a trust. Exactly. Ex- correct. Hey, someone taught me. <laughs> so, Good to be taught. Well, when, when you work with the best in the hey, business, yeah. you learn so a few things. We're doing, the, we're doing the same thing. Yeah. Smart. Yeah, it's the best. But it's for some best. reason, I still have too many LLCs. Mm. Yeah, so the biggest probably thing. I need a can, one or two. Yeah, we, we, we need to revisit that. Okay. Yeah. The biggest thing for me was like trying to clear up bank accounts and yeah, trying it's a mess. to clear up all the different LLCs and the fees and, you know, when yeah, one yeah. expires versus the other and the certificates of good standing. And it just kind of became like its own monster monster. Yeah. And yeah, it was I like, hear, how, how I do hear we you. clean this up? And yeah. Brennan was able to do that for us. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's put a, p- a pin in that one. For, yeah. For me. <laughs> so you started doing demo. Correct. And at some point you also decided to start acquiring property. Yeah, that's right. Hopefully at the same time. Uh, years, not years later, about five years later, okay. I bought my still, first house. Still a great time. Yeah, I bought my first house in 2017. So um, Multi? Yep, multi. So it was really kind of like a three family for me, but it was a two. So sure. what happened was, is, you know, I had you know, lived out on my own, had an apartment, moved back home, moved back to an apartment, you know, done that once or twice in the early 20s. Yeah, you know, yeah. Figuring Who out didn't? what's going on. And then um, I started looking for uh, my first house. So- Fun fact about property is everything after that first house was an off-market deal. I never bought anything else again that was on the market. Mm -hmm. Um, Love this. So that first house was uh, listed, and it was a two-family that needed a significant amount of work. But it also had a detached three-bay garage. And I thought, hey, this would be a great place for me to, you know, not only buy a place for me to live in the two family, generate income, but also an office. So for me, it was like buying the best three family sure. I could possibly no buy. Um, and that was in Peabody. Lin- okay, cool. Peabody, yep. So I bought that, operated out of that for, you know, still still to this day. Awesome. Um, it's excellent. The and demo company. The it, demo company, yeah. yeah. It's more just like a home office. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from there, you know, once I had that, I renovated, you know, the entire property inside and out, generated our uh, rents, had the office running uh, once I renovated the garage space. Um, and then from there, I pretty much moved out when I bought a condo. I had lived there pretty much the entire time up until that. Um, and from there, all these different off-market opportunities had presented themselves to me, and I took full advantage of that. Yeah. That's interesting. I definitely want to pull back that onion. Yeah, eventually. Absolutely. Yeah, D- yeah. And so, just I have walk so us many questions. So, just I walk us through. Six years later, <laughs> business is obviously growing. Correct. I know you just mentioned offline seven, eight employees, yep. nine employees, something like that. Yep. Um, we were, we were all just running payroll, and the, and the I other, hate and the, I hate every other Wednesday. Yeah, it's like yeah. my staff. You know, really you're supposed like avoids me. Supposed to do it on Monday, but we. we just no, mine is three o'clock on Wednesday. That's yeah, the that's deadline. Like the deadline. Was that why they email me every Wednesday morning and you still remind have a, me? Still yes. on the yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I just yeah. thought it was that was when you sent so it. So we do it on Tuesday, so it gives us a day to like Revise. make sure there's anything that needs to be oh. done. Yeah. Smart, smart. Yeah. Yeah, we should, we I should. learn so much from you every yeah. time we talk. <laughs> likewise, yeah. likewise, I can't wait to never do that again. Yeah, quite frankly. Yeah. Re- um, is it bad to want to hire someone to do the payroll? No, that's no. exactly yeah. what you should Like, do. I shouldn't that's, be running payroll. You should have a bookkeeper yeah. in your office. Yeah. Well, we do, but he doesn't do that. Our, uh, our, our, um, yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, so a, a lot's changed in the demo business. So catch us up on the journey of, uh, of small business life. Yes. Yeah, so and then let's talk a little wait, bit about Wait, can I ask a question before we get to that? Sure. So 
when did you start do? Because you also have another gig, right? Like, so when did you? How long have you been doing like um, emergency response too? Yeah. So uh, firefighting. So, yeah. Um, in 2012, which is the same year I started my business, I was just a call fireman on the Raleigh Fire Department, which is basically on an as-needed basis. Did you um, have a beeper? I did. Oh, yeah, one of the big. I always more, wanted a beeper. Yeah, no, no, you don't. Trust me. Oh, I kind of um, do. So that was, you know, from the time I was like 21 till 25, 26. It was a five-year uh, part of that department, and then from there I moved. Um, to PBD, and when I got when I moved to PBD, I had uh, transitioned over to the Linfield Fire Department, where I'm also a call firefighter. Um, those are it's a little bit more defined, a little bit more involved. It's it's scheduled shifts out 30 days at a time, um, and including additional response for personnel like myself if there's an incident. Um, so it, it's it's a great it's the best thing that could ever happen to me. It is it's an awesome part time job. Um, for Benefits. Me to, no benefits. It's just like on a per diem pay scale, you know, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You for hour, hour for hour. Sure. Um, but it, it definitely, it definitely, <laughs> um, <laughs> it definitely um, affords me the availability and the opportunity to, you know, go out there and do that job, but make sure that my two businesses are my main focus. Right. Um, so I can work as much as, you know, 60 hours a week or no hours a week. Um, depending on what I have going on. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so it works but, out really well. So you have like three jobs. Yeah. 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 You're, a, you're a hardworking guy. I like to hustle. I love, yeah, you know, I think you are. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. One, one of the core values behind me on the wall is we just re, we just reframed drive hustle oh. as to a more politically correct yeah. drive. Mm. Externally, I don't know, it sounds, sounds better, but hustle. I love the hustle. Man. I like hustle too. I know Big. you've mentioned a few times to stop hitting the, uh, the table, but. Being an Italian, having no place no. to put my hands. I you can put them on there. You just yeah, you just have to hold they, them. They move. I can't. I can't. Yeah. I, can't the, the, I can't. not. The mics are so good; it picks them up. Yeah, yeah. That's why I have to. Need, uh, that's why I have to be a centimeter from it. <laughs> 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 picks up the table fine, but it can't hear me if I stand back like this. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, <laughs> it's the vibration. Yeah. No. Listen. Yeah. yeah we need the. I'm those, all about the vibration. Uh, we need <laughs> those anti anti shock. Uh, yeah, we got to um, rub a mat. For yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. There yeah. you go. We'll, we'll bring that in. So yeah. I'll wear my we'll, mittens next. We'll put it on our list. Yeah. Mittens would be good. We should hand yeah. up mittens. Yeah, yeah, right. That's a good idea. Um, right. So catch us up a little bit on the kind of the journey of small business, and then I'd love to hear a little bit more about the real estate portfolio. Yeah, so, you know, going back, starting the business, 2012, hiring the first set of employees around 2013, early 2014, um, and just growing from there. What was the first hire? What was? It was just a general labor. Okay. Uh, so we hired two general, or I should say, I hired two general laborers uh, pretty much right out the gate. It was one immediately following the other. Um, and that, we stayed just a three-person small business for a few years. Uh, we grew two to three times what we were initially doing in business in just by hiring those two employees, and it allowed me to continue to grow. At one point, we were running roughly 17 employees, wow. and right now we have, I would say, the least amount of employees that we've ever had. The difference is now is the quality of the employee that we have. The group of guys that I have with me now that have been there for three years or more are unbelievable. Yeah. Um, they do two, two to three X the work. Yeah, of a, you know, yeah. you pay for it and sure. you're definitely, but the quality of the employee and the investment that they make with me and I make with them is yeah. worth it. The only trouble is with that is sometimes it's hard to split the guys and take on the volume of work that yeah. you have. So yeah. I don't doubt my guy's ability to put nine guys into a brownstone in Boston and produce the same that has 15 guys. Right. The difference is when someone else calls me and says, oh, I have a bathroom, I have a kitchen, I have this, and we're committed to a job site, I don't have the manpower to necessarily split them yeah. and send them somewhere else. So that, that is where it definitely... What do, you, what do you do with that? Yeah. So you can, you can do one of two things. One is uh, there's another company that we use uh, to increase our manpower that we've built relationships with over the years where if, you know, if I need to scale up for a job, you know, I can hire four or five guys of their employees. And staffing. And staffing, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, it, and it works Skilled, paid, re yeah. really well. They're different than a labor company. A labor company's mixed bag. I've never sure. really had great luck with that. It's usually always been a babysitting gig. Um, yeah. But, you know, going to another skilled labor company that is its own demo company and asbestos company, you know, it's not typical. I know a lot of people probably don't say it out loud to say, oh, sometimes I supplement, you know, with four guys from somebody else. But it is a lot more common than you think. Mm -hmm. Oh, I bet. You know, yeah. especially right now with the labor shortage everywhere. Yeah. Um, 
Do you ever um, try and like book the job and sublet it? Not typically. No. You know, I, I typically don't like to do that. I would say there's jobs that might be outside my service area. So, for instance, you know, we just got a call for a job out in Winchington, Mass. You know, I'm not. Where's that? I oh, yeah. can't even tell you. We're not driving. It's not out. one of the W's I'm familiar with. Yeah, exactly. So I'm not I'm not driving out to Winchenden. You know yeah. what I mean? It's just not happening. Yeah. So in this case, yeah, I'll sublet that job. I've already let them know that it won't be me directly on that job, and they're perfectly okay with it. Sure. Because for them, it comes down to service and their budget and their money. If we can provide that right. service for them within their budget, they don't really necessarily yeah. care. Well, I think they'd rather take your referral, too, with, as a reputable company Correct. and someone you trust yeah. than try and go find somebody themselves. And we've done plenty of work for them mm-hmm. as well, so I think they know that if – I'm the one who's saying, hey, this is how it's going to yeah. be handled and it'll be just fine. And I think they agree. And you'll monetize that? Of course, yeah. yeah we'll smart. send out a site supervisor or somebody that can touch base with them and be a direct point of contact for that job. So And so you'll bill it direct. You'll take all the rev and, you'll, and, you'll, yeah. and you'll pay the... Yep, just yeah. like any smart. normal contractor would yeah, you know, yeah. for, for anything. It would be like a general contractor running a job that hires a plumber. Yeah, yeah, you know, understood. They're, they're okay. still servicing that. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. It's good stuff. And so tell, tell us just a little bit more about the... Uh, the org structure, so to speak, now, is it is it mostly still paid labor? You have some staff probably as so, well now, right? Yeah, so uh, so for myself, I like to do all the estimating, client relations. Um, I go out and just... Rain make. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And just check on the jobs, right? So um, my job's really to just go around checking with clients and checking with my guys to make sure that everything's going smoothly. Do yeah. they have what they need to complete the task? You know, where are we at with labor? Where are we at with budget? Where are we at with all that stuff? That's really my day-to-day operations. From there, we have... Uh, Mike, who is the now general manager of the company. So Mike handles like a lot of the office, like back end stuff. Sure. He'll monitor like employees, payroll, um, hiring, firing, you know, tools, making sure the fleet's like serviced and stuff like that. And then he'll supplement in as a supervisor out in the field as needed. Uh, Mike, you know, I really don't want him out in the field because he could be better served elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and where I, where I have more of a flexible schedule, it's better for me to do those site visits and make sure we're on track, on time and on budget. Um, after that, you have two field supervisors and then the rest are general laborers. Um, so, you know, right now sitting at nine employees, um, you know, it, it's, it's definitely a comfortable spot to be in. And again, uh, you know, I wish I could take nine employees that I have now and turn those exact nine into 18. But sometimes it's not worth hiring two people no. that you don't know what you're going to get. And next thing you know, three or four of your aces become sour. Yep. Yeah. It, it's just not the risk I'm willing to take right now. Yeah, understood. Very and, cool. And what's going on in the market with, I'm assuming that your business is tied to renovating and renovations. So, you know, I know we've talked a lot on the podcast about interest rates and how it's impacting uh, real estate transactions. Have you noticed an impact in renovations with the climb in interest rates? Great question. No, I no. I okay. haven't seen anything. Our phone is still ringing. Our our uh, services are needed day in and day out. Uh, for the first time in roughly twelve years, we've I've had the business. Um, we worked Saturday and Sunday. Uh, yeah. I've never worked a Sunday in demo in my life. It was the one day where I just said absolutely not. I- I would you don't say, even like to answer your work phone on Sundays. No, I'm no, shocked by no, this. I, no. I would say actually that like in-home type renovations right now are probably at an all-time high because people are pulling the equity out of their property instead of forfeiting their low interest rate right. and doing additions. Right. They're remodeling, you know, especially off of like a post-COVID type stuff. But like right. everyone who's thinking about moving right now, you really need to like need to move. The motivation has to be super high. Or you can just modify your existing property, right. hopefully, into what you need. But isn't it expensive to pull money out? I mean, it is, but HELOCs but are still... Yeah, but listen, you can, pay, you can pay, you know, 10, 11, 12% on a HELOC and still have a smaller payment than... A new house. Yeah, a new house at, True. at twice the cost at seven, now seven and a half percent. Plus, you know, I think people are taking that, that money and reinvesting in themselves and their family. So, yeah. you know, you're building the equity again by taking that money out and putting it back. You know, your yeah. house will still increase no its doubt. value. So. No doubt. And are you seeing builders still, you know, buying, I don't know, three families and turning them into condos? Do you do any of that, like so more that institutional a, stuff? Yeah, I, I don't see a lot down. of that right now. As okay. far as like the condo conversions and yeah. stuff, I am not seeing an awful lot of that. Yeah, it's a, it has to so be So mostly a, resident, like 
owner occupied single family ish stuff. Yeah, so like tenant fit outs and commercial construction is always going to be there. It's 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 always something that you can rely on. Um, but I think residential construction is still all time high, out of control, yeah. busy. I have not seen any slowdown period at all. Good to know. Yeah, good stuff. Talk to us a little bit about uh, the real estate portfolio. So kind of circling back to the first property I bought in 2017, it really was allowed me to parlay my next move. Right. Um, and again, like I was kind of talking about earlier, every property since that one has been an off market deal. So I've flipped. Uh, I'm so intrigued by this. Yeah. I've flipped two, two families, two single families and a three family. I also have no condo conversions. No, no. Okay. I also um, just built my first ground up three family. That's going to be added to the portfolio. Love it. Um, and I'm currently uh, renovating to sell a two family in Everett. And from there, I also have three three families, a two family, and the um, garage for the office, like I yeah. was talking about. So. Um, every single one of those was just relationships and people, you know, calling me, knowing that I was interested in stuff. And so how did they know you were interested? Do you, do you, when you're talking to people, let them know that you're looking to buy? Cause Seth, at one point, I think you told me this yeah. is how you got your first multifamily was that you, instead of saying, Hey, this is Seth from reference, you'd say, Hey, I'm Seth and I'm looking yeah, for you're, multifamily. You're a bigger, bigger pockets guy. Probably you ever listen to it. What'd you say? Bigger pockets podcast. No, no. All about it. real estate investing and whatnot. So I just remember early on, like it's like saying hi to people. Hey, how are you? It's such a waste of time because no one actually gives a shit. Right. <laughs> I ever, love that. You know you're what I mean? So, right. so they started saying, Hey, Hey, what's going on, man? I hope you're well. Same type of thing. Right. right. Say, by the way, I'm, I'm trying and then tell them what you need. Like how, like how can we help each other? Right. You know, like, Hey, what's on your punch list right now? I'm trying to buy multifamily and I need creative financing. If you know anyone, I'd love for you to put us in touch. That's excellent. And like, and I was like, Oh, that's a really good idea. And like, I went hard on that for like six months. And sure enough, a broker was like, Hey, you should talk to so-and-so. They're not going to give it to a broker, ironically. And, uh, th- you know, he, he'll do some creative, that. <laughs> he'll do some, uh, creative, we'll get fi- to that. he'll do some creative financing if you're interested. And I, so I was like, yeah, do you have his contact number? And so I ended up buying that three family off market from him in 2016. That's awesome. Seller financed. Right. So my first addition to my portfolio, uh, was an opportunity that was brought to me by my cousin. So he had a partner in a, in a property where he and the partner needed to get out of the deal. Uh, they had owned it since 2006. This was right around 2018. Um, and they wanted to kind of go their separate ways, not for any reason other than they just didn't have the time to take care of the property. It was time to move yeah. on. And I offered to come in and buy one of the partners out. And the other partner agreed, which happened to be my cousin, and said, you know, I'll stick around if you're going to, you know, step in and help us with management. It's what we don't have time to do. And uh, so I was able to get in and buy out a partner um, and now that is how I acquired the first three family that I was sure. really be adding to the portfolio. From there, everything grew very fast. Um, so <clears throat> the, the three family that shared a driveway with us uh, was in shambles. Uh, the tenants just kind of had stuff everywhere. I mean, there was yeah, yeah. seven or eight 20 pound propane tanks in the driveway at one point yeah, with like three freezers. And, yeah. and, uh, I was like, the I love sh- that look. Oh yeah. It's good. Yeah. yeah. That's good. It's I really was like, good, the, yeah. the sh- neighbors love it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, no, they don't. The oh, city really? loves it too. I, not, I bet. I was not pleased. Yeah. So, uh, anytime that my house could just accidentally explode based off a neighbor's carelessness <laughs> is really what I'm into. Yeah, you know? right, exactly. I mean, it depends on how much you like your house, I guess. Yeah. I suppose that's yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. I just wouldn't like to be home. Yeah. You know? <laughs> So I came in like new sheriff in town. I had asked the, uh, the owner Locke, uh, he's from Quincy, if um, you know, he, could, he could help clean up. And knowing that we were a removal company, I said, listen, I'll pay for it. I'll do it. You just need to give me permission. And that is all I had to say. I had both dump trucks out there, my guys cleaning up his whole property, and we were able to clean it for nothing. Just because I was doing so much work to my property that I just, didn't, hurt value. I just yeah. didn't want it to be affected. And it was easier if I just handled it myself. Fast forward like four or five months later, he calls me and he says, I want to get rid of this. I want to get rid of this property. I live in Quincy. My other properties are in Boston. Um, It's out of my way and I'm having problems with tenants. Like, would you be willing to take this on? So we were able again to come to an ideal off market. Yeah. um, And where it was just my relationship with him and being nice and helping him through his problems. There was other things along the way. He offered it to me first. Um, So I was able to buy my next three family uh, just by saying hi to the neighbor. Yeah. Um, awesome. So, so that was the next one. Yeah. 
sprinkled in between those, there was other opportunities to flip homes. I had said, you know, I had flipped a couple properties in the past, singles and twos. Um, and those also came to me off market deals, just much like yourself, you know, telling people, Hey, this is what I want. This is what I need. Uh, people would say, Oh, you bought another three. I thought you had a two. Oh, well, I'm looking to do the next one. Oh, right. what's the next one? Right. Hey, I have this. And it was, you know, a, a rundown, you know, borderline crack house in Lynn. Yeah, sure, and, sure. and I was able to, you know, sell it and do really well with it. Nice. Um, so I like to flip a house, uh, for profit and then buy the next property with that profit for hold um, and it. add it to the portfolio. Yeah. So, so it's almost usually, alternate, like, oh yeah. like one yeah. flip to one hold exactly. to one flip to one hold. Exactly. So, yeah. so just a quick question, because obviously sometimes this works out where you can obviously just pull the cash back out. Right. So, so why is that your mantra versus pull the cash back out and kind of hunker down and keep it? So I think for me, it was just coming up with the down deposit money, yeah, yeah. right? So like if you need to have that money in order to play the game, uh, you can't just do that, right? So if I go to a bank and I say, hey, you know, I have all this, but I don't have too much money right now, and I'm going to suck everything I own out of that to do the next one, it's going to be hard. That's what I want to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah you exactly. want to over leverage. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. So I, I would be over leveraged. King yeah. of over leverage. Yeah. 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 So it just, it for the way I. My finances it's smarter up and stuff. Yeah, yeah. it was yeah, and probably t- talks yeah. to your yeah. risk yeah. tolerance, exactly. right? Yeah. Like you yeah. like risk, yeah. but not that much. That's right. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's I, I definitely wouldn't call you risk adverse, uh, but yeah. you're but that's you're right. conservative on the risk sometimes. That's right. Yeah. I like to weigh out the pros and cons. Yeah. And I'll if it's a little more risky <laughs> than safe, I'll probably still do it. Yeah. But if it's a lot more risky than safe, I'll probably walk away. Yeah. Out of Andrew or, or myself. Oh, you are definitely riskier, but he. Oh, this is a tough one, right? Because if we were business partners, it'd be it'd be bad. That's what you're saying. No, bad, no, 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 no. You yeah. he would he would pull you in, and oh, and really? he would. He's like a taskmaster. He is very focused. Like he he's he's he'd be a great business partner for you actually, because no, no, you no. have great ideas, and he's a great executioner. He's also great at ideas, but I'd say you're better at execution. There is very few things that I've ever had put in front of me where I couldn't execute on them. And if I'm not able to execute it on them immediately, I'm going to find somebody who is. Um, Have we talked to you about 35 read? (laughs) (laughs) No, we have, I think, but send it my way. Noted. Yeah. Um, We, we did talk to him about it. Oh yeah. It's just, it's been so long. Well, we'll, we'll follow up on that. It's still around. Don't worry. Oh, is this over Christmas dinner? Yes. Oh, wow. That was a while ago. Not to remind you. Yeah. Anyhow, no, should, you, you should know, strike that one from the record, right? Yeah, hundred oh, yeah. percent. Can we just talk delete about how you made that Kevin Hart reference and no one got it? I, yeah, the, thank yeah, you. I, appreciate I, that. I was ready to go jump all over yeah. that. It's been coming up a lot oh, lately. I, I really like it. it. Yeah, so I don't know it. The chicken. I, I mean, the I don't. Skit? I don't oh. know. Yeah, this. I, I. I can't repeat it, but it's a very funny. It's a very funny skit. I think we'll have to have them uh, yeah, yeah. add that. Uh, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll do that offline. We'll do that offline. Short little clip. Yeah. Um, no, but I, I, I think that one of the things we talk a lot about on the podcast is, you know, in growing your business and working through your business, like, you know, you and Seth are both, you, you know, sort of different than me that you guys are solo, right? And I have a, a business partner. And, you know, I think that sometimes it, you know, sometimes there are benefits to both, right? Like, Agreed. I do much better because my skill set is on one side of the ledger and my business partners is very different. I was just going to say that. So like, I'm a lot more like Andrew, like I'm more of an executioner than I am a, a a idea guy. That's right. right? And my business partner is like a hundred percent ideas and the visionary and the integrator. Yeah. So like, that's important though for, for anybody starting a business or, you know, doing business or trying to build their real estate portfolio is like, you have to be, you have to understand yourself enough right. to know what you're good at and to know what you're not good at and to rely on people that can help you on the things you're not good at, whether it's a, a business partner or whether it's a uh, referral partner that gets what you're good at and can provide you with opportunities. Like yeah. anything, self-awareness is yeah. key, right? So if you're aware of your strengths and weaknesses and I know what your strengths and weaknesses are and I'm, hey, you know, where, where I'm not so strong, Brandon's going to pick up for me, you right. know, and, and I think that's definitely key. And I, you know, with you and Dan, I think that's unbelievable to watch you two work together because literally it's, you guys are the exact opposite. Which is the best. so well. Yeah. It's really, really good. 
Okay, so you had mentioned off market a few times. Yeah. So, um, in these off market deals, do you feel like you've paid under market value for your acquisition? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, and was there any other off market stuff worth mentioning? Uh, no, there's there's really nothing. You know, again, from the first you know property I acquired to moving forward, everything after that's been off market. Yeah. It, and it sounds like you also look at ways to increase the utility of the properties you buy, yeah, right? Correct. Like you talked about the one, your first one, that you saw something different as a place that you could live and run your business. That's correct. Right? So you created a lot more value in that property for yourself just by doing that. Does the business pay rent? It does. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. yeah. Smart. And, and I think a lot of people that are good investors and that we've had on on the podcast all sort of say the same thing. Like right. you have to look at it. And I think uh, Nick Dar from Broad Sound talked about oh, this wow. is that, um, you know, he wouldn't go in and like try to go from a double to a triple. Yeah. Right. But he'd go to make a double, you know, two family into, you know, a three bedroom instead of a two bedroom. Right. right. Like the zoning. Yeah, he's, the like, city. he's like, he's like the king of enclosing porches to add bedrooms. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing wrong it's with it's that. smart. No, he raises porches the rent. Don't yeah. make money and they burn your house down. Yeah. <laughs> First thing that comes off any property I own is a porch. Really? See you later. Yep. Absolutely <laughs> gone. Cheap demo. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Because that's where you would smoke. Well, that's where people, that's where grill. people grill when they're, they're not supposed, supposed to. to. They smoke. They leave stuff out there. Yeah. One of the three they put families. all the, the propane tanks. Yep. So like one of the three families I bought, first thing I did, I went around the back of the house and I went, oh my God, there was two grills, six mattresses on one deck. Like it was just like, nope, yeah. this is coming off. Yeah. Because I don't have the time to babysit you to know enough that you're not going to do this again. It's, it's like in the dictionary on how to create, have like an arson problem. Yeah. yeah. Mattresses yeah. and a grill. Yeah. Right? Uh-huh. So. Yeah. Definitions. So I said, nope. <laughs> See you later. No deck. Was there some lint back there and yeah, some stuff right. too? The dryer, the, dryer, the, dryer, the dryer. That's in the dryer. The dryer was venting yeah, right out there too. Yeah. Right to yeah. the porch. Yeah, there's an open kerosene torch too. Yeah, so exactly. Um, so let's see. Let's, learning so much. So yeah. talk. Who knew? Uh, well, we have we have firemen in our blood. Yeah. Not yeah. me personally, of course, yeah. but dad and whatnot. So, uh, so talk to me about this off market. I, I, you said something offline where you'd never give an exclusive to somebody as a, as a broker. And I was just like, I, you we know, so let's this. stop that. We had to stop the conversation yeah, to keep it fresh for the podcast. Right. So like, um, t- tell me a little bit more about that. Like, why is that your opinion as a seller? Okay. okay. Because here's the deal. When you flip those properties, are you saying you sold them off market or you didn't get them? You didn't give an exclusive to somebody. I didn't give an exclusive. So, to so basically a broker brought you a buyer and got paid. Correct. But you didn't pay a listing side of things. Yeah. So, so. Okay. The, word, the word never is strong, right? So we to prefer say not like, to. Right. So to say like I would never. You try it this. first yourself. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So I think you need to, if you have relationships and you're. Which you do, obviously. In the know. And it's the world that you live in. It's going to be easier to operate to find another buyer on your own. I don't feel as though I should be paying someone 50% of the commission to do a job that I'm capable of doing. So therefore, I will always give it my best effort first and then fall back to what else needs to be done. Sure. Um, so, you know, if it's going to save me 2% or 1% or whatever it ends up being. Six. Four per, 4% six, sometimes. Yeah. Right, 4%. You know what I mean? Then, then yes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that off-market deal. Sure. Uh, and I'm going to sell that property on my own. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, obviously you just go through an attorney's office or whatever. So, yeah, no doubt. So to me, I think that's always smarter just based on, holding back some of your own money. It's yeah, why yeah. I give it away. You know, yeah. in some cases we're talking $50,000 yeah, no more or less, you know, mm-hmm. completely get it. Commissions can be super big. Exactly. So, um, I'm going to, I'm trying to slice this apart real I quick. Understand. Right. So, yeah. um, don't slice too hard. I'm almost out of the uh, argumentative side of this. Oh, so, are you? Yeah. So, <laughs> Oh, we just got started oh, too. So shit. So knowing that the stuff you bought off market came at a discount, mm-hmm. right? How much was that discount? Do you think? Like in said one, differently, you said the abutting three family. Had yeah. that hit the market, what year was that? That was 20, when was that? It was pre-COVID. Everything now is pre-COVID, post-COVID. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, right. So it, I'd say like 2018. Okay. And that was in? Lynn. Okay. So, um, okay. Do you mind disclosing what you paid for it? If I remember correctly, I will try to my best yeah, to yeah. remember. I okay. don't. I don't necessarily remember. I would say I paid five twenty for it. Okay, and do you think that was so? That was below market by yeah. how much? 
I'd say 600 or a little over six probably would have been okay. So the seller. 4%. What? 4%. No, yeah. it's more like 14%. It's, yeah, I would uh, say it's more. I do, I'm not yeah. good at math. I would say it was like roughly a $75,000 yeah. to $65,000 so discount. The, there's a statistic out there that's usually for sale by owner directionally. And I'm not saying that's what you're doing, to be clear. 17% haircut on value. It's, it's like a, a stat that's rooted in fact. Okay. So do you think when you sold the properties, you left money on the table? So the example we're using was added to my portfolio. I didn't sell it. Okay. So that was to buy, renovate, and hold, uh, increase yeah. the equity, increase yeah. the bedrooms like we discussed, yeah. and get my rentals up and for the residual income, as you and I had discussed offline. That, yeah, you yeah. Know, we, we love the residual income. Love it. So um, – that is that is an example for that property. Yeah. Um, so the ones that you flipped and sold, you gave you peddled it through your network, and someone brought you a buyer. Yeah. So do you think they paid retail, or do you think you probably you were? I would say every, everything was over a, pretty much over asking. Okay. Um, so I would say you know they paid full retail for the for okay. those properties. Okay. Okay. Well, then you're winning because definitely not the, losing. The yeah. majority of people are are losing the seventeen percent. It sounds like. Yeah, I think. <clears throat> but those are averages, I think it's, right? So they must be. Well, I think when you sell off market, there is something about just simply being satisfied and, and happy with the ease of the deal. You know, the person, it's cool. The finances come together. It's great. And it's just, it's a non-hassle. I guess we just never know where it could have went if it hit the market. Yeah. So, I mean, we're strictly talking business right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I sold my condo in Linfield, um, that was listed by an agent. Sure. I thought, you know, this is going to be too difficult on my own. How am I going to find someone to buy a condo? It's yeah, not yeah. different the same product. network. It, exactly. It's a different product. So yeah, yeah. in that instance, I did use an agent. Um, yeah. Do you have a license? Do you, um, are you a licensed realtor? I am not. Hmm. Maybe you should and, get licensed and so and Hannah, you can get a referral fee. Hannah, if you're listening to this, like I've asked you 47 <laughs> times to get your real estate license. Oh, Hannah, get your license yeah, and so then you can get can, referral yeah, fees. You see that? Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with Hannah please, on that one. Please. Yeah. I, I tried to have that conversation with Jen. Yeah. yeah how did it go? She, about 18 months later after constant heckling. Yeah. Much, much. <laughs> yeah. What sounds like just yeah. went down. Yeah. yeah. Jen was just like, dude, can I tell you something? And I'm I was, not getting it. She's like, I don't want to fucking work with you. So I yeah. respect that. You know, and I was like, and we just. Yep. But stop. one of them needs to be licensed because tell him, I like what you do. About it. Right. So if, if he's buying, he can work a commission for himself into yeah. the deal. Right. Yeah. So like you Correct. do that a lot when you buy your own shit. I do. So yeah. like you should, one of you, like you or Hannah should have I, your license. It, trust me. I know if I think about all the, all the things over the years that I could have saved money on and all the times that, you know, we could have been a part of a deal somehow, uh, we, you know, we'd have it. Yeah. There'd be some residual income, right? right? So yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Like I, I actually always find it. Um, it's really difficult to sell things off market. I find, really? um, yeah, you know, so it's funny. Um, we were talking about a property the other day, you and I, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I, I know, I know about properties off market sometimes from other agents and whatnot. Right. right. So, and then obviously I'm trying to put something together as a, as a buyer's agent, right. right. And just start shopping into the network. Right. So there's things I'm in the know of because someone else is trying to peddle it off market. Um, and uh, I feel like it's very, uh, it's very handcuffy to try and actually peddle it uh, with confidence. So right. I'll give you a different example. Like I work with a, a tons, uh, probably three or four very prominent, small, 20 to 30 unit like condo developers a lot, right? So, um, and naturally, like why are they always going to have allegiance to an agent? Whoever brings them the deal or brings they them the buyer, the right? Yep. Uh, they, there's a little bit of time and money there, right? So um, if, if and when stuff goes to market, I'm their guy, right? So, but I know about the deal. I'm, I'm in it during construction. You know, I'm constantly advising and the like. And uh, I hesitate sometimes on how to pedal that to the database, so to speak. You had 6,000 agents and 14,000 potential leads, so to speak, who want to buy and sell or work in the Boston area. So the second I pedal it to somebody, if someone knows the project, they just they cut me right out. Right. And so there's this balance of how do you, with confidence, off-market advertise without 
being cut out. And I, and I find, I personally find that very tricky. Well, I think it's a little bit different. I think the example is slightly different from what you're saying. And what I'm saying is because I'm the owner. Yeah. So like if you're the agent, I right. can understand why there's a hesitation there. Right. Or it's harder for you to take my lead and put that out there right. when I don't sign you on as an agent. Right. Right. But as the owner, I have nothing to lose. I know. And if I need to make the decision to go to the listing. I think yeah. you're both saying the same thing. No, it's it's ju- it's an interesting quandary, yeah. so to speak, right? Because like, let's. Are we saying the same thing? I think so, a yeah. Little, yeah. Yeah, we're just, we're just saying it from two from different from sides different of the sides. table. Right, yeah. exactly. Yes, it's exactly. different yes. if Brendan is the buyer. That's right. Like, uh, we were talking about another property the other day. Like, I have a buyer for, and I so I want to go see it. And it's an off-market property. At the end of the day, completely different story. And at this point, because it's off-market, I'm going to try and kick the teeth in of the owner right? because it's not being exposed and or it's been shopped Correct. and I know it's not being sold. Right. So I get to set maybe a higher commission rate, a lower commission rate, whatever I got to do to get the deal done. Uh, you know, th- it's great if you're the buyer, but if I'm trying to find a buyer and I need to start peddling and I don't know the person right off the top That's of my right. head, this is where there's some confusion where, so let's say, Hey Seth, I have this exclusive three unit in Lynn that I actually want to sell as condos. Can you, can you peddle it off market for me? Like, it's weird to then ship it out to everybody because sometimes, unfortunately, it's going to get to other brokers. But and what, then that broker is going to hit me up to hit you up. At the end of the day, I'm the fucking middleman. But, and, it's, and it's easy as hell to cut me out. But why as an owner, right? I get Andrew's point care? as an owner why he wouldn't want to pay a commission if he could sell it himself. But I don't understand why I would go to you as an agent and say, I'll pay you a commission if you bring me a buyer and I don't want to go on market. So, like, what's the benefit to an owner to do a, you know, sort of pocket listing or off market. It's the, it's the delta of the selling commission. Right. It's two to 3% or four. Or five but you're going to take a commission as a buyer's agent, but it's, it's a lower rate. So every, every, every contract I sign is a listing commission and a Cobra commission. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we determine that typically as a listing agent with the seller's help. So if, if there's no seller's agent, there's no advertising costs, there's no hard costs, there's no invasion of privacy, there's no showings and the like of, you know, open houses, whatever you want to call it. Um, n- maybe no marketing materials, but if I just simply have a buyer, I can come in. You so know, when so, you so do saving. an off market, you're only representing the buyer. I, in a you perfect have no world, relationship with the seller. In a That's perfect right. world. God. Or So this is the thing, like when you... So you start talking to your network yeah, because right. at the end of the day, I'd like to deliver for the client. Yeah. So just like you reach out to your network, which happens to probably be a litany of agents, yeah. it's, ga- it's the hunger games, right? right? When, I do, the, which when I do the same thing, the when I do the he same thing, watching the hunger games. I'm coming back, but instead of maybe 2 to 3% as a buyer's commission, now we're asking for 5 to 6 you know, and so what's the point at that point? And here's the deal. Maybe it's, maybe it's off market. Maybe it's the right price. Maybe it isn't. But maybe I'm just taking a... That- Hundred percent too. You know, if, right, if, so, if I know we're going to operate in the four to five percent range, yeah, and you come back to me with five percent because you're only representing one side of the deal, or you know that I have the easiest thing you can do is push me off the roof. That's right, and and just watch, right, and then <laughs> and Joe, love Joe, every minute. Joe of it. Joe Bro with the buyers right back at the table. That's right, and guess what I did? I just worked and didn't get paid. Right? Yeah, so it, I, that's what I'm saying. It's very interesting because I, to do my best job for an off-market person is, is simply having the buyer. Mm-hmm. And, if, and, and obviously, if I don't have the buyer, I want to go find the buyer. 100%. And when I go to find the buyer, I unfortunately clue in the <laughs> hundreds the of community. agents. Yeah. yeah, and then next thing you know, someone just calls the dude because I can look up his number in eight seconds on Google. Right. You and can. No, I'm just pro- I mean, probably. I mean, Boston they're looking for Boston and, and Demo. Right. <laughs> Hopefully you they know? can find that. Yeah, it's just like, it's, it's, it's just always interesting. From, from the... From the seller's perspective, I understand my point. And from yeah. the agent's perspective, I completely understand your point. Yeah. I, I think this... Doesn't mean, it doesn't mean you're going to change or do it differently. That's I, right. I, I get That's it. That's right. I get it. I, um, so you know what drives me nuts? And, yeah, I, and I this, don't. It, yeah. It'd be but I want to A know. lot of different yeah. things. So I'll give you a perfect example, and it's happened to me time and time again, is when I take the stance of the owner who doesn't want to go to market, yeah. and I talk to an agent... An agent will always, or most of the time, give me a sales pitch. Well, Andrew, the best thing that we can do is go on market to maximize your exposure. So listen, but they don't (laughs) come right out and say that. And what I say, they do this, they've done this, it just happened to me this past weekend, where I'm very crystal clear. 
Sometimes I tell people, stop thinking and just listen to what I'm saying because it means exactly what I'm saying and not what you're thinking. And I, people, I've heard him say and that. And people don't understand that. But I'm like, no, seriously, you're thinking I'm meaning something different than the words that are coming out of my mouth. I mean exactly yeah. what I'm saying. So stop. So they try and appease you for a week or exactly. two and say, hey, what if, what if we exactly. bring, put it in the market? So they say, I'll say, hey, you yes, know, I'm not sure yeah. if I want to do this or that. You know, if you have a buyer, you can let me know. You can represent the buyer and you can come back to me and we can see how we can do a deal, et cetera, et cetera. Well, sure enough, they come back to me and they say, hey, I ran it by my people and nothing really worked out. So I think we should go ahead and list it and I can send you over a disclosure and I can do this. And I go, you must have misunderstood me. I said that you could <laughs> come to buyer. me with a buyer. So yeah, you yeah. can be the buyer's agent, but you're not going to be the seller's agent. Yeah, yeah. And at that point, you could see them kind of sink in their chair. Deflate, yeah. And they're like, oh, well, and I'm like, listen, there's, there's something should change. Let me know. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's no inventory out there. There's, right. there's not a lot. So yeah, yeah. are all- these people that have had more than four conversations with you? Ever? Uh, no. Not okay. Usually. All right. All I right. can tell you that. like the second you know you, like yeah. I know when Andrew tells me something, there is no co- no like pretext in it. It is 100% whatever the words were. I love that's that. what he meant. Yeah. And like he's not changing and he's not bullshitting and there's no like there's no way air of on. anything. Yeah. Like that is the fact. So the people that I've had that conversation with where it came down to the example that I just gave, yeah. we haven't had to have that conversation again. Got it. <laughs> so. Yeah. No, well, it takes enough. one time. I, That's right. I completely get it. Um, it's interesting. Even as an owner of property, I've actually paid another agent here to sell it for me. But I don't disagree with that logic either. Yeah. Because sometimes someone else handling your personal investments better. is better than you. Because there's emotion that might come into play or 100%. there's other things. And sometimes it's like... It's a lot of weird justification that happens. Yeah, it, yeah. it is. It's odd. But like... Why take away from your skill set making money over here to to represent yourself? It's like, I'd rather just know that there's a set cost for this person to do it and I'll continue to go make money and do my thing. But yet you'll still also sell real estate. That's right. Yeah. (laughs) Which once again, if you're going to keep buying real estate, you you or Hannah need to get your license so that you can collect commissions on that. That's right. Yeah. There's a lot, there's a lot of rules, which, uh, for lack of a better word, inboarding those commissions. That's right. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree with it. Yeah, but there are also like free, free place, yeah. free yeah. place. Yeah, that's pretty great. Free real estate's good. I love free real yeah. estate. I've not been fortunate enough to come across free real estate. But well, so well, you got to work Seth's program. Yeah, I, this, this is it. I mean, you're. I think you're already doing it. The difference is, I hold a license and <clears throat> and probably can finagle some stuff, right? So, value add opportunity, residential or commercial, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not free. Obviously, everything comes with a cost, but Usually, um, stale listings, rundown property, big vacancy, and super, super underutilized rents. We're like, from a commercial finance standpoint, which I'm sure you're a little savvy with, like, it just, that shit don't work. Doesn't work. Like, the debt service coverage sucks. Doesn't pencil out, yeah, as they yeah, say. Correct. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like a train wreck on mm-hmm. paper. And uh, it's it's almost always mismanaged by the broker. I love train wrecks. Ironically, right? And They're so, your favorite. So, you can, favorite. Yeah, so, you can come in. You, you know, you run your numbers and you find out the number that works. You try and do a, a lower cash offer. I've uh, cross collateralized stuff and pulled money out of other properties uh, with liens, gone private money. It doesn't matter for the acquisition. Um, usually do an inspection. Again, this is a, it's a bleeding asset. Essentially do an inspection. You can renegotiate some terms, get, get some additional seller credits. Seth, don't bang the table. <laughs> I'm doing it very gently. <laughs> um, get some additional seller credits, um, take the commission, go to closing. There's no real cash out of pocket because you, you, you'll cross collateralize stuff, right? And then uh, clean up, renovate, refinance. Always always comes out after it's leased. At a, it pencils out and you can get all your cash back yep. in a pretty in a pretty short order. Yep. So the Equity in bigger yeah. pockets language that's burr, a burr. Burr, burr, yeah. yeah. So um, <clears throat> buy rent. Refinance, buy, yeah. repeat. Yeah, buy, renovate, rent, rent refinance. refinance, repeat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, it's like, uh, what's it? The uh, worst house on the best street. You know, yeah, I, mean? yeah. You know, I look for those opportunities all the time. I yeah. don't want to buy something where the equity is already built in. I want to find that opportunity where it's under rented, un, you know, mismanaged, needs work. Because as a contractor, right. you know, my Your role, cost is so my much Rolodex too. of of people and their capabilities is vast. So I can usually, you know, acquire that property, hit the ground running, get it going and, and get that, get that. Yeah. You're doing it faster for cheaper. Right. 
and that's why it works. And buying it me. off market, it's and that's why it works. It's for a me. great, yeah, it's a great yeah. way to go. So but, what do you? But so it doesn't always go right, right? Like sometimes shit can go sideways and and not be what you expect. Has that ever happened to you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tell us about that. <laughs> so which is deal the, specifically are we talking? I'm about? thinking about the one that is just coming to completion, right? Like that was not what you expected. The three family. I'm I, th- I think yeah. you actually yeah. called yeah. me about this. So I did. I, I tried to unload it on and you, and I said, "What's the price?" And I yeah. said, "No, that's yeah. no thanks." One point. <laughs> Thirty million dollars, yeah. Uh, so basically, what happened with this was is we waive inspection, right? So yeah, you know, you go into a property. I know what I'm looking for because I know either how extensive the renovation is going to be. So therefore, the stuff that might be of concern to someone else isn't a concern for me. Sure. I'm replacing all the electrical. I'm replacing yeah. all the plumbing. I don't care about that stuff. Right. Right. So it doesn't matter. Well, in this instance, we we. I keep saying we. I <laughs> bought, bought a the royal we. Yeah, bought a three unit structure. It was commercial. It was a pizza place on the first floor, and it was two units above that. So I get in there. We're doing the demo. It appeared to have been a slab on grade home. Mm. So we start pulling up the subflooring, and the joists just start rolling over. Every time we pull up a piece of plywood, they'd be so rotted, and they'd roll over. We get below the floor. There was never, never any access point to the floor, and it's a three-foot crawl space that's full of muddy water. And the exterior, uh, you know, the perimeter of the foundation had fallen into the pit. And basically, in this crawl space laid joists, burnt-out wood, and water, and mud, and Knock it down. some of the foundation. <laughs> so we had already spent all this time and money acquiring this, pro- this project, to renovate it into the three family that sits now, but it was supposed to be a reno. It wasn't supposed to be a teardown. So your permitting now comes to a stop because you have to change your permitting. The bank that's involved needs to come to a stop because they need to rework their loan because it's no longer a reno. It's now a development project. And we lost a lot of time and money on that. Fortunately, because of, again, the contacts and the relationships, I was able to pick up the pieces very quickly, yeah. probably a little bit quicker than most, um, and recover. And we were able to build a beautiful three-family, two four-beds, one three-bed there. Um, it is kind of an ugly box, but it's a moneymaker. Yeah. And, you know, and we have plenty of parking. There's a billboard on the property oh, that we yeah. rent as well. So, um, it, it, you. It, you know, it was a project where... I thought I was going to die because <laughs> I was so stressed out. And I hear like you. things, you know, when time and money is on the line, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot at stake. Yeah. You don't sleep well. Yep. So, but now you're on the flip side of it. Now I'm on the flip side of and it. And how do you feel about it now? I feel great. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad to have my occupancy and all the, every unit's wow. rented. It starts on the 1st of Get September. Out. And so this uh, is going to be a hold. This is definitely a hold. This all is right. definitely Shit's profitable. Brand new. It's going to take me about three years, maybe four years to recoup all my expenses and, and overages that I had to pay for because the project changed. Mm-hmm. But, you know, in three years, I'm going to be sitting flush and, yeah, that's awesome. you know, be, and it will continue to appreciate other people oh, yeah. are paying the loan. That's right. And, and, you're and, that, air, and that area moving is turning over yeah. like crazy. Yeah, so. I, lo- I love Lynn. Um, let me ask you a question. So um, from a permitting standpoint, so when that thing gets condemned, or whatever. It, yeah, right? no, that's exactly what like, happened. Like, now, do you have to fully go through zoning to rebuild the exact th- same thing? Um, kind of, sort of, not really. So, kind of, sort of, not really. So, you have to hire the best zoning attorneys. That's yeah, right. It's, you know, but we, you and I have talked about this. Yeah. That's Dan Cahill. Correct? So, that is Dan Cahill. Cahill. We've talked about this so much, how zoning is so restrictive, right? So, walk me through just quickly. Don't the, get me started on how much the, I hate The zoning. timeline of you're, you're trying to do the right stuff here. Yep. Rehab and, yep. and increase resi. Yep. Right. In an area that needs housing. Okay. So, and from, from when stop work, you know, happened or whatever mm-hmm. to new foundation, I'm sure. What was that gap? So the two <laughs> biggest hangups actually were, so you have to remember the, it's already been per- permitted for what it's used for and it's already um, zoned for what it is. Okay. So I didn't have to go through any real zoning changes. The only thing change of use or something. Nope. The only thing was, is the setbacks because the original existing building was grandfathered in because it didn't meet the setback requirements, non-conforming. So you have to go to ISD and your attorney and make sure that these non-conforming, um, uses can make, can stay. 
And based on the building and its condition, and it becomes such a safety hazard, and you have a structural engineer came in, the city said, you have a structural engineer come in, we'll work with your attorney through this process, and we'll see where it's going to go. So, But ultimately, you still have to go through zoning. That's correct. So, and mm-hmm. a special permit to recreate the same exact structure. Correct. So, we so were timeline? In, I would say the two biggest hangups would be the bank and uh, the structural engineer. So the structural engineer oh. getting them to produce the report and come out and take a look took like a month, which isn't terrible, but it's a month. It's not mm-hmm. great. It's not great. And then from there, you also had to, you know, have the bank work through it. So they only want to work through it once you have all new Approval. plans, all new approvals, and then their process starts. So, you know, so frustrating. trying to bring everybody Sign around. my money. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So it was, we probably lost four months. That's so crazy. Four months. And it was a 13 month turnaround start to finish. That's which incredible. Is, which isn't bad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it was really good. It, it came down to getting the right subcontractors lined up immediately to perform the work. Um, wow. And, you know, the relationships help. And I bet That's the subcontractors don't fuck you. Uh, my subcontractors <laughs> are Loyal. awesome. Yeah. And the team that I continue don't to bite use the, for everything. You don't buy the hand that feeds right. you. Yeah. Yeah, you know, sh- shout out to all the subcontractors. You guys, it's, you know, Jay Kelly Electric, Jim Kelly, he's unbelievable. He's been there for me every step of the way. Uh, my cousin Chris, Nardone Plumbing, he's been there for me every step of the way. Uh, Tarnowski Construction, uh, who is, you know, who I, um, who I use for all my utilities and site work. Um, he's a great partner. Um, Steve Wenzel from Banner Environmental over on the asbestos side of things. Um, just a huge network to payroll construction uh, for roofing, gutters, siding, windows. Um, just there's just a slew of people that I, I'm probably missing a few. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, know. so f- for like average real estate investor, you know, this probably could have been a disaster. It would have like, killed. It, it would have killed, killed, killed most nine people, out of ten people, right? Yeah, most people probably would have died. Between the capital reserves yeah. that you had to have to tolerate the cash investment. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, there was the a $200,000 swing in budget from th- what the reno was supposed to be versus what a new build was supposed to be. So you had to have had that capital readily available mm-hmm. to take this project on. And it got to a point where, like you had mentioned, you know, hey, you were trying to offload this at yeah. one point is because we we're in this weird spot where the project wasn't completed yet, but we were almost there. And it basically became like, I just need to punch this home. Yeah. And I'm glad I did. I'm glad I stuck it out. And I think stress was the driving factor for why I wanted to unload it at the time because I was like if I can just break even on this and walk away right yeah, now yeah. and I don't have to it's deal with this for win. another four months it's, it's a win, win. Um, but I'm glad I stuck it out yeah it's awesome. gonna work out just fine looking back what do you think is the biggest lesson you learned from that that's wow. a tough one that's, that's a, just that, all that all that one. stuff's hidden right? yeah, yeah so. so I mean I, oh, I don't even mean the like would you have done it differently buying it? I mean, just going through the experience and, and like no, what I wouldn't have because there wasn't a, a single person there that I think was like negligent or malicious in the sense that we truly thought the house was a slab on grade. Yeah. There was no reason for there to be five layers of plywood with no access to the crawl space. Um, so therefore no one knew it was there. Um, you know, that, that building level was, you know, almost dead flush with the, with the, uh, grade. was that on market? off market so you know so it just it just i wouldn't have done anything differently it was just one of those things where you know there's another semester at harvard and i didn't have to go you know but have you learned anything about yourself through the process or anything about absolutely not i'm perfect all right all right well whatever um i think you know i just i need to be more patient and i need to not you know, get so stressed out. Uh, There's the gold I was yeah, looking yeah. for. I, I, you know, again, when we were talking about that, that shit I'll, changes people. Though, I know. Man. Yeah. I know. When, when, when you're going through it, you don't even realize it, you know, yeah. and I remember calling you and Dan yeah. and Sean over at Salem five and, you know, having help. a couple freak outs <laughs> and a couple, and really what I was saying is please help me. But there was a lot of F bombs in there. <laughs> yeah. Dude, you know? I hear you. I, I flipped a three family in, uh, in Winthrop. Jeez. 2018, 19. It was the second one I did. And, uh, grossly miss you know underestimated the renovation and just dumb things like you just don't know when you're starting like it, i'm sure you would have you would have thought about this having a demo company but like there's a main road there's no parking we closed i think december 7th you know what you can't do in december 7th on water street? lines you, well you, you can't put, you can't put a dumpster on the road yeah oh because of the snow yeah yeah they don't let you yeah you have to wait till april yeah. so, so every demo truck was a live rolling live load yep yep which 
I needed police details for. That sounds like, um, dude, it was wild. Expensive. Where was this? this is in Winthrop. Sounds like I mean, it's a bureaucracy, probably yeah, a little I was bit too. Say, but it sounds like, like a little bit much. Yes, yeah, so it's just but. like crazy. And then, like, so we started storing it in the backyard. Someone put us on fire watch. You know, as I said, I have like a, the fire department stand there. Yeah. You know, so then you pay extra to get the load fast. It was just wild, like the stuff that came up. Yeah. And I spent probably 30, 40 grand more on construction than I needed yep. to. And yep. eventually through that process, I mean, we did the whole thing in nine months, which I thought was good that, for, for a three that's unit. That's very right? good. Um, full reno. Full reno. That's excellent. Of, of only two units because okay. the third was tenanted. Okay. Off the record, yeah. Um, but we did clean up per <laughs> on unit. the podcast. Off, yeah. The yeah. We did. Uh, we did. That clean was years ago. Now, yeah. Yeah. We, and we did clean up her unit, but it was it was super easy to do so. But yeah. um, yeah. So we did that, and uh, but yeah, completely ran out of money. Like I with think, three months left, I think <laughs> being in the game of contracting and having a demolition company and just being around and having done enough flips and used enough subs is you kind of build up this understanding of what stuff costs, right? So even yeah. through inflation and everything, you still have an understanding of what stuff costs. So when I walk through, such as like the two family in Everett right now that I'm doing, and I walk through and I, you know, I visit the site twice for an hour each time, and I walk out and I'm like, yeah, it's a $250,000 rental. Right. You know, I'll right. break it down for you once I get pen to paper and I'll figure it out and I'll get yeah, some yeah. more people to walk through, but that's the budget. That's where we need to be, you know? And if I'm within 10%, you know, for, for it's not bad, not bad. You know what I mean? You need to account for that. But I think having a good understanding of construction, uh, logistics, planning, how stuff really works, permitting inspections, um, it helps. It yeah. certainly helps. Yeah. And were you close? That one's almost done, right? Yeah, so that one's going to finish up uh, either this week or next week. We're at punch list items, basically. Um, and we're going to be, it was a $250,000 reno. I think we're going to be under ten grand over. So we're going to be right there. So you're, you're pretty good at this. Yeah, right there. Keep it up. Yeah. And you'll sell that. Yeah, that's off good. market. That's off market. Yeah. Off What's market. What's the price? Uh, we're going to be looking for about nine twenty five. Cool. Doesn't yeah. sound bad. Yeah. Fully done over to family and Everett. Fully run over. Uh, everything's run over. been done. Yeah. Run over. Run done over. over. Um, and done over well. Like, you don't fuck around and, no, and do shit work. You do Connors, good work. Stainless uh, appliance, you know, appliances, new garage. Um what else? Hardwood floors throughout, new plumbing, new electrical, um, every, everything. Top to bottom, the house has been done. Roof, the foundation's been repointed and repaired. Oh. Um, you know, we took all the asbestos siding off. Do you have a buyer? Off market. Do you well, have a off buyer? Off market. We'll have to work on that. Yeah. Um, that is not he, w- he wants to go visit it, it sounds like. I, I oh, probably do. Um, visit it. So another question, um, and the last thing we'll talk about maybe about this, but uh, why not conduit? I've never done condo conversions. And I just don't know that another city that I'm unfamiliar with would have been the perfect place to start sure. that process. Yeah. Honest. Um, yeah. Um, so Happy to run the comps for you. Yeah. I. You know, the best part about condos, as you've already talked about, they unfortunately, it's a different buyer. They have to go on market. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Exactly. exactly. That sounded like a pitch. No, yeah, it's, 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 pitch. it's yeah. interesting. Like um, the condo sell, sellout. Nine out of ten times is is worth it financially. Yeah. yeah, so I'm not against it. It's just unfamiliar to me, so it's not the go to option, right? So if I think that the amount of money or profit that I think I'm going to get is, and I'm going to fall where I need to, I'm not going to risk something. Or you know, I know of somebody in Salem that just renovated a two family, an absolute stunning renovation for both units, condoized it and got stock hold in the bag because the other one yeah. wouldn't sell. Yeah. Now, granted, he was a little bit over budget and those things obviously got pushed into the asking price. Mm-hmm. And I think he might've been priced a little bit too high sure. uh, right out the gate. But again, he got stuck holding the bag for one of those units for much longer than anticipated. And I just don't want that to yeah, happen understood. to me. You know? It's interesting right now. Um, Two families specifically, I'm I'm finding, are like an epic hot commodity right now. Yeah. For for two reasons, obviously, single family housing and condos have become so expensive, uh, locally, at these rates, that people are looking for a way to purchase and own and build equity. Right. Um, uh, and subsidize their income. Number one, and then number two, um, there's a lot of financing restrictions with three and four unit properties. With the type of financing you can get, specifically under fifteen percent down, um you're pigeonholed usually to an FHA type program and FHA has to go through self-sufficiency. You know what I'm talking about? No, no. So literally the, if, if you have a three unit, that's a million dollars. Um, and you have $10,000 in rent for the three units. Mm -hmm. Um, 
an FHA buyer, the, the part of the underwriting guideline is the property, the principal and interest and all the other costs, taxes, et cetera, your escrow, um, cannot exceed 75% of the rents. Okay. Okay. So, so that means their, their mortgage has to be under $7,500. For it to pencil out, and at seven and a half, it's probably not going to pencil. It don't. Out. It should don't work. Yeah. Yet, if it was a two family, doesn't matter. No self sufficiency. Right, because it's ones and twos. That's right. it. Yep. Yeah. So it's it's interesting where the two pricing has started to really creep, as the three pricing has kind of stayed a little bit more stagnant. We almost just got murdered by a crane. Yeah, I think. I, I'm not um, sure what that not was. Not the best. Not the best studio sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, it's actually been really interesting, like to see the multifamily specifically twos attract a ton of attention, especially the stuff around here. That sometimes has that sneaky third apartment in the basement or the attic or yeah, something. So I think something to your point with the two family that's going to become in a market for me is the top unit is two floors, one bath, four bed, full living room, full kitchen, and the bottom units, three bed, one bath with a garage underneath. So, yeah. you know, if a, if an, a family or someone was looking for that property on an FHA, they could come in and acquire two full floors of right. living space right. and have someone helping them pay the rent or yep. the mortgage and on the first the floor. the agent's not going to be out there painting the bulkheads That's because right. it's brand new. It's and a it's brand pass. new. I mean, this yeah. house is FHA. turnkey. Yeah. Gorgeous. Yeah. So, so I think cool. you just created an argument against condos. No, I, uh, I didn't necessarily create an argument against condos. I just simply noted <laughs> that the two family pricing has started to oh. really run up. I oh. think where you're, where, where three families oh, and four families will, headed. will. Yeah, I mean, you'll see a, you'll see a two family right now for seven ninety nine, and you'll see a three family in the same city for eight ninety nine. Right. And you're like, how does and, that And one work? sitting because it just, unless right. you're the investor. That's correct. Who's putting 15 plus percent down. It's literally not financeable. That's right. It's, it's just really hard. So like, like when we sold um, Pleasant Street, I think we got three or four offers on it. And at the end of the day, three of the four were FHA. Right. And, and so you like, knew it wouldn't fly. Yeah, I'm just right. like, hey, man, like, I'm not an idiot. I'm all set. Like, thanks, though. Oh, we'll pay more. It doesn't matter. Right. You can pay more. You need that to get better That makes the problem financing. worse. Yeah. Right. So, the more you right. pay, the less it is affordable. Yeah, it just doesn't under, work. I, yeah. I know what the rents are. They're, right. uh, they're leases. I, they're mine. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been pretty interesting. So, um, okay, last thing I want to talk about, uh, just reverting back to small business, and then we're probably – I don't know what time. Um, talk to me a little bit about the struggles of growing the business. I'm, I'm reading a really good book right now. It's called Predictable Success. Highly recommend. Um, and it talks a lot about, like, when you're growing a business, it starts, like, out of passion, fun, side hustle. And you, and you go through these early struggles of cash, labor, uh, leverage, whatever you want to call it. Um, not being the guy to run payroll, you know, because you got to do this other stuff. And then you reach this like really fun stage where like business is humming and like you're starting to grow a little bit. And then you punch through fun and they call it a uh, whitewater, which have you ever been whitewater rafting? Of course. I love right. It. Like, you know, you better watch who's in the fucking raft with you, man. Right. Because like if, if you screw up, like we're dying, yeah. you know, right. or, or someone's going overboard, right? right? You get a row in unison, you got to tuck your feet in like it's hard. And so it's, I thought it was a very fitting like uh, stage of growing a business where like, better hold on and you're starting to create all these processes which make it not fun right and i feel i feel like that's where you and i spend so much time, time talking yeah. about like trying to punch through these these stages and, and right after that becomes this easier place of predictable success so t- talk to me about that struggle and uh um maybe your your time in whitewater if, if you've been there right so my long-winded answer to you is, you know, a lot of the struggles that other small businesses or people might have from a personal perspective on starting a small business, I didn't have, right? So I was 21, basically almost 22 years old when I started my business. Living at home wasn't looked down upon. So right. living <laughs> in my parents' house with a bedroom, with a desk next to it that I would do my paperwork at night wasn't looked down upon. So what did that allow me to do? I had no overhead for right. office, right? My parents let me use the basement to store all my tools. No overhead. My first, my first office was $500 a month in Topsfield, where the office was about the size of this studio, maybe a little bit smaller. And that's where my first investment in overhead was. All utilities limited. included, limited, right? Now it, I got out of my parents' bedroom. I had a home base. From there, I was able to buy the two family that we talked about. Right. So my, my mortgage was costing me, after the tenant had moved in, it was $800 out-of-pocket expense for me. 
Well, I'm already paying 500 right. for an office, what so now it right? really becomes 300. I have a beautiful two-bedroom apartment that I fully renovated, and I have an office that's 10 times bigger than yeah. I had before. So I don't know about early on struggles as much as I was so fortunate to have a situation that just continually well, worked for me. By design. Make right. no mistake. Right. Right. Yeah. right. By design. So, you know, moving forward, employees are always going to be your biggest struggle. And I would yeah. say that a majority of the biggest headaches and problems that I've faced to date have all been employee driven. Um, whether it's stuff that's you really can't control, you know, a car accident because yeah. so you got your guys got rear ended and they're hurt. That's that no fault of their own. That's just right. things that happen. Or you have an employee that's, you know, constantly late or you have the employee that you had to fire because of X, Y, and Z who now files an unemployment claim. Yeah. And it's like this guy's Noise. filing unemployment and I have to go through all this process to, you know, justify why they were terminated. Right. Or you have an employee that quits and then claims he was terminated and you have to prove <laughs> why that isn't the case. Um, um, those, again, I think employees are the most rewarding, but also yeah. the most challenging yeah. aspect of the most work. Yeah. I Correct. think we Sometimes would agree yeah. with that. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, but I can't take away from the team that I have now. I'm telling you right now, the team that I have, I would take them into battle anywhere. Yeah. They're amazing. Yeah. Do you struggle with when to bring more people on? Yeah. Right. So that's, so that's one of the things we talk about a lot is like, when, when do you know it's time to add another head? Yeah. So we're there now. You okay. Know, uh, we've been there now for the last year or more uh, because, like I alluded to and spoke about earlier, you know, where we have we're completely understaffed right now, but with a much better quality of employees. So, you know, I could use two or three more guys, but I just don't want to risk bringing in the uh, sour apple sure. to the bunch and making, you know, all of a sudden two or three of my really good guys, you know, kind of follow the lead of this ne this new guy who who is, you know, sour and it ruins a crew. Yeah. Um, so right now I'm comfortable where I'm at. I'm confident where I'm at. Um, and it's the risk versus reward right now just isn't there for me. Yeah. Love it. Cool. Cool. Good stuff, man. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. I, you know, I just want to let you guys know that walking in here, I wasn't sure if this was a porn studio <laughs> or a podcast studio. And I was walking in with two guys. And let me tell you how happy I am that this is a podcast. You know, I just tell you that right now. Sometimes maybe it's both, you cameras. know. Hey, what, you know, I see a couch over there. <laughs> I mean, he does black. rent it out. Yeah. So, right. you know, he can't right. control, he can't control the, right. the, the, the well, temporary tenants. We put the other side up for rent and, uh, the, one of the increases we got was, uh, someone who wanted to, um, rent it for the weekend for, um, uh, interviews. Mm -hmm. and, of? I, and I was like, interviews of what? Yeah. Well, like, uh, it's like, yeah, I think we might have to do a little. I immediately would have said Yes. <laughs> And put a cuck chair in there. <laughs> That's why you had they, you they, put they the They were for OnlyFans performers. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it sounded a little little suspect. So, sorry if the mic is a little sticky. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just just don't is? get too close. Yeah, right. Well, uh, well I have it, these it, one centimeter away from this <laughs> mic to pick up my voice. So, <laughs> come on. Uh, Brennan, you want to close this out? Yeah, Andrew, so... We like to close out every episode with asking our guests what uh, one word would uh, describe your next 12 months if you were to boil it down to one word. Aggression. <laughs> I mean, I think that describes your life generally, but elaborate on, on what you mean it's by good, aggression. It's a good word. I like it. I'm, you know, just to say super focused, super committed um, to the pathway, which is, you know, to acquire more property, build the business, build the revenue, um, maintain the relationships that I have with people like you guys and just, you know, make sure we're all having fun. You yeah. know, I, I want to stay aggressive on the business side of things, but I want to stay aggressive on the social side of things too and make sure that it's not 80 hour work weeks, you know, mm -hmm. three months in a row, which it can be. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that I get out and have dinners and drinks and go to Encore or anywhere else with my buddies and, and just make sure we're having a blast. But stay for more than 10 minutes? Eh, eh, you know, it depends. Yeah, I pop smoke sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Seth won't come to Encore with I, us again. It's not that I won't come. He, he, it it, it would be like giving me whiskey. Really? I mean, so no. I, mean, I went to Encore probably. I He's afraid of when it. Did, when did we go to Encore? I'm not last afraid. Was like, like a, a couple, ago? like a month ago. A Dan month ago? Dan You're not afraid. Dangerously I think, like, like successful. I think you I, are. I think I told Hannah I lost two grand, and I think it was closer to six. Uh, well, she's gonna know now. Yeah. No, she won't. She's not I think, listening I think to I, this. I don't. I don't remember. Uh, I don't remember our our take, but it was it, it was, was like four grand. Yeah. 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 Go. It's I fun. won it for everybody. It was great. Yeah. It's fun. 
Yeah. That's fun. Seth is fun at the casino. Seth's fun yeah. all the time. <laughs> That's actually true. Uh, well, maybe we'll we'll have to pencil in an encore uh, <sighs> trip after this, um, but just not for so telling. We're not going to encore after this. Uh, it's one fifty p.m. <laughs> That's all right. He's like, "What's it's wrong with that?" Seven. Yeah, I haven't even read my email today, so I'm a little behind. Process times. payroll. Uh, I did do that. I, I did, did that. that. Yeah, done. Yeah, yeah. checked a couple days late. Yeah, um, three just, o'clock on Wednesdays. What? Uh, <laughs> what's the What's the unit goal for you? Like, what's What's? Uh, I know you mentioned cash flow super important. Like, where you're trying to go, and there, how can we help you get there? Yeah. Oh, so good question. That, thank you. Thank you. Um, off market. Off market deals. <laughs> off market <laughs> deals. Andrew's open yeah. for calls yeah. for yeah. off market yeah. deals. Yeah. He also likes creative seller financing. That's right. That's right. I do. Um, I do love that. There I is do, no I'm, that's unit how I'm getting goal, right? So it's it's whatever the the deal is that's in front of me. It either works or it doesn't. And the goal is to do as many deals as possible successfully. And you know there there is no stopping point. You know, I, I would it. I like to be 40, 50 years old and be in an unbelievably comfortable position? Yeah, maybe it slows down then. But being thirty three years old, there's no stopping right now. It's yeah. it's, it's awesome. Man. You know. 100 miles an hour at all times. Yeah. I love it. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, I guys. I got nothing Call else. It. Thank I you. Got nothing. Thank you.